The lack of jobs and food in poorer countries is, of course, a real problem. But could a young generation of farming innovators have an answer? Welcome to Roundtable. Hello and a very warm welcome to the programme from me, David Foster. A life in farming has not always appealed to many workers in poorer countries, but that could well be changing. A new generation is moving into the sector, providing some hope for an answer to joblessness and food insecurity. Agripreneurship combines agriculture and entrepreneurship to help tackle some of the world's pressing issues from climate change to overpopulation and urbanization. According to the UN, by 2050, there will be a food deficit affecting 300 million people. Agripreneurship seeks to create sustainable development by creating jobs, empowering young people and protecting the environment. Farming is often seen as unglamorous, but it's not just about working in a field. It's actually about entrepreneurship as well says Sherry Silva, advocate for the Rural Youth International Fund for Agricultural Development. 60% of Africa's population are under the age of 25, and with high youth unemployment, many are looking outside the traditional job sector and becoming agripreneurs. But agripreneurs from low-income backgrounds often face a disadvantage because of the lack of resources and land they have access to. Can agripreneurship be successful and profitable in the future? And will there be enough investment to help disadvantaged communities? We go around the world as well as round this table today. I'm pleased to welcome Louise Manning, Professor of Agri-Food and Supply Chain Security at the UK's Royal Agricultural University. Charlie Vase joins us, agripreneur and co-founder of Photonix. From Cape Town, we have Farai Mtero, Senior Researcher in Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of Western Cape. And we go to Switzerland too where we can see Steve Carr, Chief Executive of Agripreneurship Alliances. I'm going to go to you two uh, in South Africa and in Switzerland first. Um, Steve, you first up. An agripreneur, your alliance, is basically just farming with a posh name, isn't it? We're looking at uh, developing entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs specifically within agribusiness. So we talk about uh, opportunities for young people in um, agribusiness right through from uh, the farm, primary food production through the, to the table where food is actually produced and eaten, as well as beyond that as well. So it's looking at the whole entrepreneurial uh, range of activities within that uh, continuum. Okay, so you have to grow potatoes, you have to raise cattle, you have to do all the normal farming practices. Where does the entrepreneurship come into it? So we're looking at business. What we recognize is that 80% of the food that the world eats is produced by smallholder farmers. We're in a situation where um, the global population is increasing. Uh, by 2050, we're going to have 9.8 billion people living on this planet. And we're also facing the challenges of climate change with the impact that that has on agriculture. So we're working with universities in East Africa in particular, working with students from agricultural courses and agricultural backgrounds to look at how they can um, improve the types of agricultural systems that are available to actually find spaces that they can create um, profitable food-based businesses that can create wealth for themselves and their families and the communities of which they're part, as well as providing um, nutritious and accessible okay. and safe food to everybody Steve, around. We'll get a story from you later about mushrooms in Kenya. And Farah, I'll come to you in just a minute. But Louise, we, food insecurity is a major problem, which basically means people won't have enough to eat and it could be too expensive. Is, is this the future? I think this is part of the future. If we look at how most food is produced in um, Europe, it is produced by large organisations, uh, very streamlined systems and the entrepreneurship element is trying to address some of the small issues that they themselves can't find the answer to. So that in, in Europe there's a whole range of new opportunities. So give, let me give you an example. Mm. Food waste is a really big issue. 
Um, one of the areas where we're seeing great entrepreneurship is how we deal with food waste, how we reduce food waste, the whole area of smart fridges in our homes that will tell us when the food's going out of date, right through to the Internet of Things being applied. And right you would put this under the umbrella of agripreneurship. I would put, uh, we, I, for me, we can't be developing entrepreneurship on farms without seeing it through the whole chain. Okay. So I think the, if, we're looking at, if we're looking at applying the Internet of Things, then it has to be how we bring all of that together. So you're going to find businesses in a whole range of different sectors, but overarching that to ensure food security, they all need to work together. So it, it could be quite cool because people think that what they're doing is actually sort of working towards, um, if not saving the planet, then sort of helping to stave off some of the problems that, that we have. If we're going to address climate change, we have to have entrepreneurship at all stages of our food production. Are you going to save the planet, Charlie, with what you do? I don't know. Tell me, what is it you do? Uh, well, Fertinex is, is an ability provider. Uh, we're looking to enable, uh, whether it be uh, large tractors that are applying uh, pesticides, right through to whether it be developing farmers that, that are looking for diseases in, in their crops. And I think, to answer your first question, I think we're looking to be part of that puzzle. Uh, what we want to do is enable the latest in advances in, in academic and in research areas and put that into the hands of, of farmers because farmers don't need to be experts in plant science. They need to be experts in managing their, their supply chain, in diversification, in sustainability. And it's being able to sort of extend the knowledge of people across the broad, uh, across the, uh, the area of production. Uh, and we believe that we have the technology or part of the technology that can do that. So it's, it's 21st century farming, if you like, uh, yeah. taking the, the, the brave new world that we have and applying it to something that's been around for thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of years. Yes, it, it's targeting more traditional farming that, that had a, well, particularly on the, some of the larger farms, they had a spray and pray approach, which was apply lots of inputs and wait for lots of outputs. And, and now I think there's a, a, a large um, impetus to realize that actually we need to do uh, more with less, uh, and we have, need to have less impact. Um, there's lots of studies to show there's only uh, 60 harvests less left globally, um, and that could be quite significant on our, our agriculture. Well, we'll talk about ways of growing food hydroponics in just a moment, if we may. But Farah, let me come to you first of all. South Africa, a country with a growing population um, and perhaps the dream of going to the big cities like Cape Town, Joburg, Durban is no longer appealing. So people don't necessarily have jobs, they don't necessarily have food. And that leads you to the, to the necessity of having to convince many people that they could do something for themselves and for their community. That is agripreneurship. Yes, I mean, the idea of uh, promoting entrepreneurship in agriculture is very appealing. Uh, it's being advocated by various national governments and international development agencies. And uh, here in South Africa specifically, we, when we think about opportunities in agriculture, we cannot do that out, uh, without looking at the structure of uh, the agricultural sector itself. And uh, mainly the issue of land ownership, because historically you must remember that uh, the majority of black Africans were dispossessed of their land during the colonial period. And that uh, adverse legacy still persists so access to land is a key thing. So for young people who are interested in, in being uh, uh, investing in farming, being becoming entrepreneurs, the main yeah. the main obstacle is access to land. And uh, without access to land, uh, it, it's very difficult to. What are these um, agri villages that you're involved with? We we not involved in agri villages. Agri villages are some of the development programs that government has initiated. But the challenge is that with agri-villages is that they try to bring together uh, ordinary communities, uh, ordinary members of the community into partnerships with agribusinesses uh, in what we're, uh, they call win-win strategic partnerships. Steve, how do you convince people, other than that it is out of necessity, that this is something that they ought to do? So, so one of the big challenges that faces agriculture within the global south, actually globally, is the age of farmers. 
um, the average age of farmers now around the world is about 60 years old. And we know that young people, who often who are growing up in rural communities, do not themselves want to get involved in agriculture. And this is why we see a lot of migration from rural areas into the big cities, whether we're talking within the UK or Kampala and Uganda. So the question was, how do you change that approach? Yeah, and what we're doing is we, uh, we work with universities which are, um, in East Africa, which have got some very, very good students and uh, courses of young people who are interested in entering into agriculture and agribusiness, but seeing it as being exciting and innovative. And as your guests have already mentioned, you're trying to use the benefits of new technologies and new approaches so that people can move away from what is regarded as being traditional smallholder farming, which is hard work and the um, income is not very good from it, through to um, agribusiness, where people are actually applying technologies, skills and knowledge to actually create businesses that do good and businesses that actually can create I, wealth. I, 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 I see the desired end result and I see the necessity of it, but I still come back to this question of how do you convince young people that it's fun, it's the future, it is something they can do and be successful at? I think the main challenge has been over the last 30 years that in many farming families, the young people were told, do not farm. There is no opportunity for you, quite rightly, because there was no money in agriculture. So we've seen a whole generation move to the cities. We see a younger generation right now at universities who are going to have to fill that gap very quickly. So a key part for universities is to develop their skill set. They will be having jobs that previous generations waited 10 years to do, which is really exciting. The kinds of jobs that people are doing will change. So I think that, and we also have to remember that although the person that is on the register is 60 and signs the return and the census, that isn't the person who is right now driving the businesses that's on the tractors, that's out on the quad bikes at five o'clock in the morning going around the livestock, those people well, within That was your family this morning, That was it? my family this morning, <laughs> so... You see, but the thing is, Louise and Steve, and I'll ask you this one too, Farry, I, I, I think it's, it's the sentiment is, is fantastic, but I still come around to, and you didn't answer my point, was how do you make it exciting? How do you convince people? Charlie, what convinced you? <sighs> I think that's a good question. Well, I, we, we find it difficult enough to convince young people to get involved in agri-tech, and that's a small subsector of the agri-food area that we're discussing. And I think the issue is there's a, there's a belief or a tradition that you're sort of, you know, there's a pitchfork and muddy wellies attached to, to, to food production. And actually, there's so much more than that. There's, there's as you've already mentioned, you know, quad bikes and, and, and tractors. But some of the stuff we're dealing with is, you know, satellite and drone technology. And, and even some of the food production technology was developed by NASA. So there is a big area of exciting technology which I think is reflected by some of the big companies that have got involved in agriculture globally. I mean, you're looking at things like Google, you're looking at um, Dyson, that are really, really getting interested in this area. They see the impact that it could have. I think in terms of getting peop young people involved in the actual production right on the end, what you have to do is show that there's a business case. I think, I think there, there was a lot of um, reason that farming was quite difficult, and it was, it, was, it was low margins and a lot of manual labor. And I think now what you have to really show is this is the business case. This is the diversification. This is how you are. You have to be sort of bastions of being conservative, um, conservation, sorry. And, and I think that will get young people involved, and I think it has done, but it, it needs to continue to. Well, and we had a fascinating mm -hmm. round table, in fact, where we talked about drone technology mm. on farms. Sorry, Louise. But I, think, I think the real challenge, which has already been highlighted, is there are barriers to entry for young people, both in terms of... Self-imposed? Um, some of them are um, that the industry isn't doing enough to promote those kinds of jobs and what is out there. But also there's a barrier to entry if you are going to have a land-based food business. There are emerging technologies which don't require land. So, but also there is a capital barrier to entry. Many of the business models we've developed are, require large levels of capital to go into them. So I and think- And is this the case where you, you would then find that the entrepreneur was successful enough to be able to invest in the businesses, but the farming end of it wouldn't make enough initially to be able to do so on their own? I think you have to, you have to be market orientated. 
and much of our agricultural policy has not been market orientated. Okay. So, so you need the clever business people, Charlie, which is what you're trying to do, to help with the farmers who are producing stuff, Farry, um, not just for subsistence levels, but um, to be able to make a, a business. And they need the help of these entrepreneurs. Um, but at the same time, they also need work for themselves. It's a win-win, isn't it? Yes, uh, I think uh, the main challenge uh, has been uh, uh, farming has uh, is implicated in this uh, uh, crop, uh, high value agro value chains. So whether you're producing on a small piece of land for you to achieve uh, a, a reasonable uh, profit, you have to be able to expand, mo mobilize large amounts of capital mm. and compete with big players. So naturally, uh, young people are not in a position to mobilize sufficient resources to engage in highly productive, large-scale or industrial But, but it makes agriculture. economic sense as well, because look, I've got these figures here. 70% of jobs in Africa come from farming, and yet Africa imports $35 billion worth of food every year if africa could become more self-sufficient and provide in you know, provide jobs for all of those people who are entering the workforce every year an estimated i think it's 12 million or so then this it wouldn't be solved but the certainly square in the circle would have come some way yes it looks like uh, it's an option but uh, looking at the prevailing set of conditions in farming across the world uh, those uh, uh, conditions are not favorable to the participation of young people because you must remember that the majority of uh, smallholder farmers are located in sub Saharan Africa, Latin America, and some parts of Asia. Mm. And uh, there's a challenge in terms of uh, competitive profitability amongst those smallholder producers uh, because they have to compete with large scale farmers from other parts of the world. Okay, so, unless... so perhaps it's not cost effective at the moment. There might be a way of making it, it more so. Uh, I want you to tell us about mushrooms in Kenya. That's one of your, one of your projects at the moment, just as an illustration. Okay, so part of this is that people, young people from my experience in, Afri in Eastern Africa are really enthused about agriculture and agribusiness. This is where many people, their communi home communities, uh, come from these areas and young people themselves are looking at a way to enable themselves to stay within their home communities but make a good living. And so one of the things that's part of this is that it's the business skills that people are looking for. A lot of the young people we work with um, are, at, as I mentioned, university. They've got the technical skills which can implement really good effective businesses, but they need the business knowledge, the capital, the market differentiation, and about how to structure and launch a business. So we've been working with um, partners, and um, the result of this is that people develop business plans, identifying local needs, local opportunities, and creating businesses from that. And the example that you're picking up there is some of our friends at Laikipia University in Kenya, um, which is about two, three hours north of Nairobi in the Highlands. And this is a group of students who've identified that there is a, a shortage of mushrooms in the local community uh, nationally, that it's a much um, sought after food product, that it's something that is part of people's cultural diets but it's also something which is nutritious. It provides high levels of protein and the supply does not meet demand. So they're looking at um, launching in two months time, then brand new mushroom business, which will be small scale, intensive farming, but on organic principles where they're going to be selling mushrooms to the local communities, but with the aim of being able to then develop the, their business to upscale, to actually start then working with um, local supermarket chains, as well as um, export markets as well. Extraordinary. Is this the, um, the second agricultural revolution? Well, some people say it's the third or fourth. Um, with Put going right, from then. the wheel, first of all, to using livestock, um, to then having the first mechanisation. Um, I think it is a, re a revolution, but we've talked about the fact that people will be farmers. 
most of the people that will come into this space as agripreneurs will not be farmers. In, the, in be, the old fashioned sense of having a field. In the old fashioned sense of si having a field or sitting on a tractor. They'll be the people designing the software to support farmers in decision making tools. There'll be people that will be able to gather a whole range of data for farmers and then say, this is the data from different parts of your farm, this is how it comes together. But, and we forget something quite fundamental with livestock, the people working with animals every day must have what's called in farming stockmanship, although it is a gender, genderless term. People still have to understand animals if they're working with them. They have to be able to see, hear, smell, and use those senses and combine them with the technology. You see, what you've got is, is you, you've got your traditional people down on the farm, as you say, doing stockmanship, mm. yep? uh, and also understanding what that particular weevil might be if mm. it's infecting the, the, the wheat or whatever. Uh, then you have the people elsewhere, and that is where you see the creation of jobs. So you don't think that this new high-tech stuff will necessarily take away jobs down on the farm. They'll just be moved elsewhere? I think, there has, I think it's situational, and it depends on different countries. It depends on your society. It depends on where you are on a spectrum hmm. towards industrialised farming as to where those jobs will be and how many people you will have. But it's important to recognise that even th that right now there are farmers all over the world that are getting out their mobile phone. They have a whole set of apps. They'll be checking how much their chickens have eaten in the last 20 minutes. They will be able to get information from a whole range of um, sources on their farms. And I think the mobile phone itself has a huge op opportunity in countries that are just coming into this kind of technology. Where, where do you, Charlie, where do you want to go um, as an agripreneur? Do you still like the smell of the farm, the <laughs> freezing cold winter mornings, or is yeah, that something that you, you, well, you now wear a suit and tie? Well, we, yeah. well, we, mostly, uh, we mostly deal with arable farms at the moment, which, which don't, don't smell too bad. We, did, we have done some work on the livestock ones, which are, which are you know, hardcore farming, as, as, as I would call it, I think. Um, I, th I, th I think for me, what I'd like to do is bring together more parts of the, 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 the agri-food chain. I think what we saw as, as, a, as sort of a, a, what we'd saw an agri-tech business was that actually there was quite a lot of disjoint between the one that was sort of producing the food, the ones that were processing the food, the ones that were buying the food. And there are some technologies looking to sort of cut across that. But actually, some of the big players in there are already realizing that there is a real integration. You know, farms are no longer food production factories. We don't just press a button and get food anymore. Mm. We need to be able to produce the right amount of food and not have to plow it back into the field because there's too much. OK, get that. Then Farry and, uh, and, and then Steve, is, is this the way we solve the world's uh, food problems in terms of quantity and the extreme poverty that you see in a lot of countries because people don't have work? Farry first. Yeah, well, I, I think the main challenge is that where is value being captured in agriculture? So it's not actually uh, primary production that is benefiting uh, from the profits that are being in, uh, earned in agriculture, in farming, but it's uh, upstream and downstream of agriculture, uh, upstream where people supply inputs. And in this instance, when you're talking about the softwares, uh, in relation to the fourth industrial revolution, those are the but, people. But, but are going sorry to, to cut you short, but do you think this will come go a long way towards helping food security and people's livelihoods? I don't think so. I'm very skeptic. I mean, it will just mean huge profits for people who have patented and patented those that are, you know the intellectual property. We have the intellectual property of the technology, the new. Uh, methods of farming yeah. and so and those are the people who are going okay. to benefit and so, most so likely Steve, those are big corporations. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. So, so Steve, the, the suggestion is that some people will benefit, but not necessarily. This won't necessarily lead to um, a revolution in terms of production and poverty. I suppose I come from the perspective of hope. Um, I believe that young people who are driving economic creation, who are creating new entrants as um, small and medium-sized businesses, which are meeting local needs and um, take finding opportunities within the local market, can make a really significant contribution to poverty alleviation and to um, towards 
provision of good quality, safe food to local populations. Um, so I think that this idea of agropreneurship, agri-entrepreneurship as some people call it, is something that is very um, popular, that state governments are getting behind and that many universities are getting involved in as well. And there is a real upsurge of interest amongst young people right across sub-Saharan Africa looking for the opportunities that this could actually um, give them in the future. And the Agricultural or Agripreneurship Alliance looking for crowdfunding. I know, listen, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate your time, Faro, from South Africa. Charlie, all the very best of luck. Safe journey home, Louise, <laughs> because you're going to be needed down on the farm Absolutely. in the early hours of tomorrow morning. It was five o'clock this morning. Good job, it's summer. Uh, thank you very much indeed uh, to all of you and thank you for watching this program on the future of agriculture where it can perhaps make some people very rich and end the hunger of others. From me, David Foster, from the team, goodbye for now. <laughs>